Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining today um, on this talk on achieving hormone balance. I'm uh, going to get into a lot of detail over here um, on one of my favorite topics, um, where the first part of the talk, we're really going to be talking, focusing more on hormones and hormone imbalance and lifestyle things and, you know, the whys and the, the hows. Um, and in the second part of the talk, we're going to be focusing a lot more on bioidentical hormones um, and trying to clear up some of the myths. Unfortunately, there's lots of misunderstandings and myths that are out there today about bioidentical hormones. And I want to kind of bring out some of the research to light and really go over that in detail. So thank you. Let me start off by introducing myself. I'm Dr. Hirani, uh, Sushma Hirani. Uh, I did my residency and training in family medicine in Michigan. After that, I started practicing in a uh, family medicine office and realized there was a lot of things I couldn't treat within the boundaries of mainstream medicine. Anyway, that's when I started exploring more alternative forms, and here I am today. So my approach is I try to combine the best of both worlds. I use traditional medicine when absolutely necessary. My preference is to work with natural or functional medicine, where we really try to look for the root cause, see what's going on in the body, and bring the body under better balance. So we have a lot to cover today. I'm going to talk a little bit fast, but hopefully you can hear me. I do want to uh, start off, though, by saying that everybody will be getting a recording of this whole presentation. And so if there's important slides that you want to review and go over more detail later on, feel free to, you know, dissect it further um, on your own time. But I want to make sure I get through some of the most important information here today. Uh, please feel free to chat in the chat box at the end. I will go over all questions in the end, but in the meantime, please feel free as you remember questions, just go ahead and type them into the chat box and we will um, try to get through all of that at the end. All right, so let's get started here. All right, so one of the very first endocrine experiments ever done was by Professor Arnold Berthold in, um, 1849. He was actually the curator of the local zoo where he lived. And you can see on the right side there, what he did was he, he saw some chickens, he removed their testes. And when he removed their testes, he saw some changes. Their comb and waddles became very small. They had no interest in hens. And, you know, they lost some of their typical aggressive behavior that they present with. Then what he did is he found that those testes had a certain substance in it, and he injected that substance back into these hens and what he or into these chickens. And what they what he found was, well, all that behavior come back, came back. Their comb and waddles became normal. They had the interest in hens again and back to their aggressive behavior. OK, so basically what he discovered is that there's some sort of a substance that exists in this organ that plays a role or impacts behavior or changes in behavior. All right. Now we know that particular substance to be known as hormones. So what are hormones? These are chemical substances that act like messenger molecules in the body. They're made in one part of the body, but then they travel through the bloodstream across other parts of the body where they actually help to regulate both body function and behavior. So I think of the hormones like an orchestra. Each hormone is like a different instrument and they all play an important role in the body. And, you know, just like in an orchestra, all the different musical instruments have to play with each other to create harmony and peace. Same with our hormones. So if, you know, if the hormones are not playing appropriately, well, we're going to get noise instead of harmony. And so both ways it's true. You know, even if one hormone is playing perfectly and everybody else is playing poorly, it's not going to work and vice versa, right? If all the hormones are, you know, um, not playing well and one, or excuse me, if one of the hormones is playing very well and none of the others are, we're still going to get discord and disharmony, right? So the, the, the hypothalamus in our brain is the conductor of this orchestra and keeps sending signals to the different hormones to work with each other. I get a lot of people, for example, coming in saying, I've got this thyroid problem and if only you could fix my thyroid, I would be feeling perfectly fine. Sometimes that is the case, but that's not always the case because even the thyroid is one of those instruments and interacts with these other instruments as well, right? So again, we wanna see how the thyroid is interplaying with the adrenals and with the ovaries or the testes, and then, you know, go ahead and make them play with each other so that we get that harmony that we're looking for. 
Hormones play a major role in our health and well-being. They help to rejuvenate, regenerate, and restore our bodies. When our hormones in are in balance, we feel good. We have good energy, good mood, radiant skin, strong bones. Um, and when our hormones are off balance, well, many times that can be the underlying cause of various different chronic illnesses, including autoimmune conditions, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, heart disease. If the hormones are off balance, we simply just don't feel good. So you can see on the slide some of the most common symptoms of hormone imbalance. Um, you know, this may sound familiar to a lot of you. Um, you know, you just don't feel good, right? So very, very important to understand what kind of hormone imbalances are going on and how we can try to correct them. So we have numerous hormones in our body. Um, for the purpose of today's talk, we're mostly going to talk about the male and female hormones, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. I'll talk a little bit about the male hormones, but typically, um, you know, we don't have as many males on this talk, but I will get into that in a little bit of detail. Mostly my talk is going to be focused on the female hormones. All right, so let's start with estrogen. Poor estrogen has developed a bad reputation over time when it really doesn't deserve it. And we'll get into the details of all of that later on. But there's many important roles that estrogen plays in the body, not just with our reproductive and menstrual health, but with a lot more. You can see it actually decreases plaque buildup. It helps to regulate cholesterol, okay? Improves um, skin elasticity and pre preserves bone density and much, much more, right? So the point is estrogen plays a large role in the body in many different aspects. Estrogens are also a little bit of a complicated hormone because it's not just that there's one estrogen. There's multiple kinds of estrogens in our body. For broad purposes, we're going to divide it into internal estrogen and external estrogen. Internal estrogens are made by our own body. We have three main types, E1, E2, and E3, as you see on the left side there. E1, as estrone, um, that's considered the quote-unquote bad estrogen. Um, the one that has an increased risk of, you know, cancer causing uh, profiles. E2 or estradiol, that's the main estrogen in the body, the most abundant one. That's the one that actually regulates our menstrual cycle and the one that drops off later on at menopause. And then estriol is considered the weakest, but the most beneficial estrogen, mostly produced during pregnancy, but in small amounts at other times as well. Men also have these three estrogens, but in much, much smaller quantities. So those are the internal estrogens, and we have the external estrogens, which are made outside of the body. And there we have kind of three kinds as well. We have the synthetic estrogens, which are uh, man-made in labs, usually for medical use. The most common there would be birth control pills or hormone replacement therapy. Then we have what's known as xenoestrogens, which are the quote-unquote bad estrogens. These are pollutants that come from man-made products. Okay, like chem uh, household chemicals, genetically modified foods, you know, the hormones that they inject into non-organic meats and dairies, things like that. And finally, we have the phytoestrogens, which are plant-based estrogens found in certain foods like soybeans and flax seeds. So, you know, you hear sort of one camp of experts and people saying, oh, estrogen's good for you, you should take estrogen. And then you hear the other camp of people saying, oh, estrogen's bad, stay away from it. So what is it? Is it good or bad? And again, we're gonna get into all of this in more detail later on, but the fact of the matter is, you know, it could be good or bad. Um, and that's dependent on various different things. One is what kinds of estrogens are coming into your body. Two is how that estrogen is being processed in your body. And three is how that estrogen is balanced against progesterone. Okay. But this slide over here kind of depicts the difference in the way the good and the bad estrogen acts or behaves in our body. On the left side, you can see normal, natural, quote unquote, good estrogen binding to the receptor. Think of hormones like a lock and key. So the hormone is the key that go, goes and binds onto a receptor site or a lock in our body. It unlocks that receptor to the cell, sending the message or the signal so that that action can occur, okay? And that's what's happening on the left side, the light pink. In the case of the xenoestrogen, the dark pink on the right side, this is an altered estrogen structure. That's also going and binding to the receptor, but it's not the right key for the right lock, 
it still kind of turns that you know lock but not in the right way and therefore instead of sending the proper signals or the appropriate signals it sends unintended signals for example the good estrogen may say bone build bone or heart you know remove plaque whereas the bad estrogen may say the opposite bone break bone and you know let's uh, keep plaque all right so big big differences are opposite sometimes with that good and bad estrogen so what are the sources of some of these quote unquote bad estrogens or xenoestrogens in our environment? Unfortunately, they're all over the place. And that's perhaps one of the reasons where in our modern world, we see all kinds of male and female hormone imbalances because we're being exposed to so many of these xenoestrogens in our environment. Now, we can't completely eliminate them unless we choose to go live in the Himalayas somewhere, um, but we can certainly reduce the effect of these bad estrogens in our body by limiting some of our exposures. And we'll get more into that later on. You know, I think awareness is the biggest thing. So, you know, pesticides, herbicides are, are big, a big example, right? Our food is being sprayed with all these pesticides and we're eating that, right? So do you also eat with that mask on? So just as important as the estrogen coming into our body is important how the estrogen is processed in our body and actually how it leaves or is eliminated from our body. I told you estrogen is complicated, but let's kind of break up the slide a little bit. So there's three different pathways on how estrogen is used by our body. In the first pathway, think of estrogen as going down three different highways, the good, bad, and the ugly. Okay, so the 2-OH is the good or beneficial pathway. The 4 and the 16 are the bad. So if our estrogen's going down the good pathway, then it's doing all the good things that we want it to. It's affecting our heart, our brain, our bone, our hair, skin, and nails, et cetera, all in a positive way. If it's going down the bad pathway, it's affecting all of those same organs in a negative way. Plus, it can increase our risk of female cancers as well as blood clotting. Okay. Can we tell if our estrogen is good or bad? Absolutely, we can. A little bit later, I'll show you some sample you know, test slides there, which, which shows that you can actually measure if you have more of the 2OH or the good one, or if you have more of the bad, 4 or 16. And again, the same process in men as well. So I do measure these estrogen pathways in men also. Um, women increase risk of breast, uterine, and ovarian cancer, but men can have an increased risk of prostate cancer if you've got these bad estrogens. Okay. Phase two is methylation. The estrogens basically have to become deactivated so that they can go to phase three, which is elimination. Now these bad quote unquote and deactivated estrogens leave the body mostly through our gut. Okay, so goes into the bile eliminated via our stool. So our gut health really can also impact how our body is processing estrogen. If we have imbalances in our gut bacteria or inflammation or something called leaky gut, then we don't really process that estrogen properly. And some of the bad estrogen may hang on, okay? Hang around in our body, creating hormone imbalances. So yes, there is a very big link between gut health and uh, male and female hormone balance. So typically, um, Premenopausal women or you know uh, menstruating women will usually have more commonly symptoms of high estrogen, either because again we're getting too much of these environmental estrogens or we're not detoxifying or metabolizing it properly. You can see on the right side there; these are just some of the symptoms of high estrogen. So if this is if it builds up in the body, again, unfortunately, these are very very common symptoms. Um, men can also get uh, you know breast lumps and increase breast size uh, with. Uh, too much of the estrogen in the body. And then also estrogen can definitely affect mood, anxiety, irritability, you know, snappiness, impatience. It can affect energy. It can affect sleep all in the wrong way. Okay. On the left side, we see symptoms of low estrogen. Although menstruating women can see this, this is more common typically in perimenopause or menopause when, uh, you know, the estrogen levels drop. And that's when you feel most of those symptoms that you see after menopause. So what are some natural ways we can reduce or detoxify those estrogens from our body? I'm not gonna get into all the details on this slide and there's a lot more, but these are some of the big ones, okay? Really make sure you're taking care of your gut health, increase cruciferous vegetables, avoid those environmental estrogens and then stress management and uh, body fat loss, not just weight loss, but fat loss. You wanna build muscle and lose fat, 
Okay. And a lot more, but these are important things which can actually make a big difference, especially younger women that are first coming in, you know, maybe periods have just recently started and getting a lot of PMS and, you know, symptoms surrounding that um, can really, really make a big difference. A lot of times just with lifestyle changes alone, as we get older, it gets a little bit more in-depth and more um, work and effort may be needed where we really need to get more into, you know, supplements and bioidentical hormones and things like that. So um, balance is key. You know, we've been talking about estrogen. Progesterone is the other major female hormone, and they really, you know, have to be well balanced to each other. Think of progesterone as the yin to estrogen's yang, whereas estrogen is more energy, movement. Progesterone is more calming and sedating. And again, balance is important, right? Because if we all walked around with too much of the stimulated feeling, well, we'd be hyper, anxious, irritable, insomnia, right? But if we walked around with the opposite, too much of the progesterone, we'd be fatigued, tired all the time, no motivation, and brain fog, right? So again, the balance is so, so important so that we, our body responds appropriately. It has energy when it's supposed to, and is able to calm down when it's supposed to. These are some of the most common symptoms of low progesterone. Notice that a lot of these low progesterone symptoms are similar to high estrogen symptoms because again, they're opposite to each other, okay? And frequently see low progesterone symptoms in again, menstruating women, um, but we can also see it during the time of perimenopause, right before menopause hits. So what is estrogen dominance? As I mentioned, estrogen and progesterone work in a certain balance or proportion to each other. Estrogen is kind of like a proliferator. It likes to build tissue. And progesterone, think of it as the manager, okay? Um, it's a stop estrogen, don't build anymore. So what happens if we don't have enough progesterone for the amount of estrogen? Well, estrogen goes crazy. It says, hey, no one's stopping me. I'm going to keep building. And some of the target tissues that it acts on are breast cells, uterine cells, fat cells and ovarian cells, right? So there's this unlimited proliferation. So people with estrogen dominance are going to be more prone to things like breast tenderness, fibrocystic breast, thick and uterine lining, heavy periods, PMS, ovarian cysts, fibroids, and proliferating fat cells, okay? So estrogen and fat are kind of like a vicious cycle because estrogen builds more fat cells and then fat cells store estrogen, right? Which then builds more fat cells, which then stores more estrogen. You kind of get this vicious cycle and, you know, men and women can get very frustrated if that type of a pattern is, you know, reproducing itself. So, you know, we definitely need adequate progesterone in that picture to control estrogen. Okay. So how do we know what's going on? You know, um, well, test, we don't have to guess. There are tests that we can do to, to measure these things. Now, I do want to make a side note there that many times blood tests may not be the best way to know a lot of this information. All right. The best testing actually for a lot of this information is either saliva testing or urine testing, because we're actually able to measure the free hormone levels, which are the active form of the hormones. Whereas in the blood, we're me mostly measuring um, total hormone levels. Okay. And the free hormones are only 1% of the total, right? So it's a very teeny tiny amount. Um, so definitely the dot, uh, the um, urine and saliva test are more accurate. On the top there, you can see a uh, picture of the Dutch urine test. When you look at the top right of that, you see progesterone. You can see how the, you know, it shows low progesterone levels in that particular sample patient. And right underneath that, you see estrogen levels, three different estrogens, and uh, those are high, right? Very high. So this person has estrogen dominance, too little progesterone for the amount of estrogen. And then the, the nice thing about the urine step test is it goes one step further where you see that pie chart on the bottom right of that picture. Um, that actually measures those three estrogen metabolites that I had spoken about before, right? The 2-OH, 4-OH, and the 16-OH. Again, the good, bad, and the ugly. So by knowing this information, we have a lot more answers and control over what we can do. So in this particular patient, we want to do things to raise their progesterone. We want to do things to reduce the estrogen, and we want to do things to re-metabolize or eliminate that estrogen properly from the body, right? And make sure that it's going down more the good pathway rather than the bad pathway. And we can accomplish this through lifestyle changes as well as through targeted supplements and when needed, bioidentical hormones. The bottom um, 
you know, saliva sample that you see there. It's a simpler test, uh, but same concept in that particular patient, you see the low normal levels of progesterone, and then you see those high levels of E1 or the bad estrogen in the body. So it can be very, very helpful to identify what's going on and then treat accordingly. Some of the hallmark symptoms of estrogen dominance, as I mentioned earlier, those are kind of on the top of the slide there. And estrogen dominance has been known to cause or contribute to breast cancer, ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, and prostate cancer. Now, men can also have estrogen dominance, all right? in relationship to a relative estrogen dominance in relationship to testosterone. So in all men and women, some testosterone converts into estrogen. That's very normal. And that's where men get a lot of their estrogen, unless it's those bad environmental xenoestrogens too, right? Remember, those are also going into men, creating imbalances. But um, if too much of that testosterone is converting over to estrogen, that can also cause that relative estrogen dominance. So in a man, you know, it's also important that we only don't just test testosterone. We test testosterone and estrogen in a man. Very important because if you're one of those people where too much of that estrogen is converting to testosterone, well, then the treatment here is not to give you more testosterone because you're just going to convert more of it to estrogen and we might make things worse. The treatment here is going to be to block that conversion. So testosterone stays as itself rather than converting to that extra estrogen, okay? So again, very important to know what's going on so that we can treat it in a targeted way. And that same pattern can happen in women as well. What are some of the causes of estrogen dominance? Well, multiple causes as written on the slide, but notice a lot of it is environmental, nutritional, diet, stress, you know? And then of course, you know, medically caused, like again, birth control pills are very common cause of estrogen dominance. So really kind of understanding where some of this is coming from, and you can measure some of this as well. So if we really want to measure the amount of BPA or glyphosate or some of these chemicals in our body, we can measure those as well, okay, to understand what's happening. You know, is it that the gut is not um, get, letting go of this, or is it coming from another source? So let's talk a little bit about the impact of stress on, on hormone balance. Um, you can see on the top there, there's pregnenolone that's considered the master of all hormones. It goes in two different directions. It goes down one pathway, progesterone, and then cortisol and cortisol is our main stress hormone. And it goes down the next pathway there, DHEA, testosterone, and estrogen. Well, if we're constantly stressed, if we've got chronic stress and we need to keep making all that cortisol um, in our body, then most of that pregnenolone is going to go in that direction, right? You're going to be generating all this cortisol. And as a result, the other pathway gets neglected or ignored. And that's why you can develop female or male hormone imbalances with high stress, because all the male and female hormones are sacrificing themselves at the cost of cortisol production to help you with the fight or flight survival with stress. Okay. Now we can alter this biochemically as well through, you know, supplements as well as um, dietary and lifestyle choices. Testosterone, um, like I said, a little bit low amounts in, in um, women and very high amounts in men. Now, everybody, everybody kind of knows the big role testosterone plays with, you know, sexual health. And it's very, you know, it's very important for sexual health, no doubt about it. But really, it's, it's a lot broader than that. I don't think everybody really understands the importance of testosterone in so many other ways as well, especially in men, okay, because it is such a high level and high amount, you know, men are simpler in that this is their main hormone. Women have a lot more, you know, the estrogen and the progesterone and the different types of estrogen and blah, blah, blah. So really, really uh, plays an important role. And in some ways, easier to, you know, to, to balance out some of the male hormones. But um, testosterone also plays a huge role with brain function, mood, and cognition, plays a huge role with musculoskeletal health, you know, build helping us to build muscle and bone and helping us to burn fat, plays a big role with bone density. It also plays a huge role with heart health. It actually Im impacts our cholesterol levels and cardiovascular health, okay? Affects energy, mood, sleep, all of that. So important, important hormone. All right, menopause. So menopause is, you know, that time in, in a woman's life where the hormone levels all kind of, well, the female hormones, all, all levels drop. These are some of the list of symptoms of menopause. The main reason I put the slide on here is just to show you how, you know, 
how vast these symptoms can be. Because I get a lot of these older women coming in saying, you know, I have all these vague symptoms. They've gone to doctor and doctor and they just can't figure it out. And they feel terrible. Things like itchy, crawly skin, burning tongue, you know, gum problems, electric shock sensation. I mean, I've heard it all, you know, and you just don't know why it's happening. Well, guess what? It could just be happening because of hormone imbalances, a drop in those hormones and menopause. Now, the most common symptoms are the ones in orange there that you see, hot flashes, night sweats. You know, these are very, very common postmenopausal symptoms. So if I want a rapid heartbeat and to get all hot, I only need to wait for my menopause symptoms. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this menopausal transition. As you can see on the slide over here, um, progesterone drops much quicker in a woman's life than estrogen drops. There's actually a 75% reduction in progesterone from the age 35 to 50, right? And there's a 35% reduction of estrogen from the ages of 35 to 50. So when menopause actually hits, there's a relative higher estrogen compared to progesterone, right? So estrogen dominance is actually a common symptom before menopause actually hits. And that's why many women, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's, if it's a little bit out of balance, not a big deal, that's normal. But if it's very much out of balance, you know, those are the women that'll experience heavy periods, frequent periods, breast tenderness, and all those really uncomfortable symptoms right before menopause hits when the estrogen drops and the periods actually stop. Okay. So that's why a lot of women will start to experience some of these impacts, you know, even starting in their mid thirties to, to mid forties, you know, when that progesterone really starts to drop. So very, very important to understand that, you know, again, it's not just estrogen that is a problem at, at perimenopause or menopause. Progesterone seems to be a big problem as well. Menopause and hot flashes. So every woman eventually goes through menopause. It's physiological, it's normal, okay? It's not technically a disease. Um, if it's very pronounced, right? If it's a very pronounced drop or, uh, or other hormones are imbalanced causing a worsening female hormone imbalance, then yes, it may need treatment. Again, I'm not gonna necessarily call it, call it a disease, but a dysfunction, which we can try to improve, again, through lifestyle supplements or hormones as needed. The average age of menopause is about 48 to 52. The actual definition of menopause is one year of no periods, okay? And nowadays, you know, with longer lifespans, women spend more than a third of their lives in menopause. That's a long period of time. So you definitely want to live comfortably, right? There's no need to suffer the rest of your life because of menopause. Now, 60 to 80% of women experience hot flashes or night sweats during and after transition. Surgical menopause is a definition of, you know, if you have a hysterectomy or you, you have your ovaries removed and you suddenly go into this menopause. Hot flashes and night sweats usually in these type of people are much more frequent and much more severe, even if the ovaries are left in. Okay, so important to recognize that. And the other thing is, you know, there's the, again, there's this myth that, you know, most women think, oh, you know, hot flashes, they last about a year and then I'll be fine. And, you know, that, that is the case for some women, but what they found is that the median duration of hot flashes have been longer than what was previously thought and can last seven to 10 years. And in fact, 10 to 15% of women have persistent hot flashes throughout their lifetime. Okay. So in some women, it, it continues for much longer. As seen on this slide over here, this is looking at women between the ages of about 40 to 60, um, you know, from the time period of one year before menopause to about two years following their last menstrual period. And you can see it's kind of split up to about a third, third, and third. A third of women get severe hot flashes, a third of them is mild, and a third of them is moderate. Hot flashes definitely impacts the quality of life. That's perhaps one of the most common reasons why women will go on bioidentical hormones. Um, definitely it disrupts sleep, the duration, quality, continuity. Definitely affects mood. People get very irritable, angry, you know, anxious, as well as uh, sad. Mostly that's because, you know, you're not sleeping well. Cognitive function, right? Mental clarity, focus, memory are tends to be worse in those people with severe hot flashes. In fact, I'll show you in a, in a few slides, brain images have actually been found to um, get worse. Whoops, so sorry. Brain images are found to be worse in people that have severe hot flashes. Okay. And then, you know, women with um, severe, moderate hot flashes definitely have worse social and professional functional abilities. 
And you know, one important thing I want to really point out over here is that a hot flash is not just a hot flash. It's actually been shown to be associated with worse long-term health outcomes. Women that have more severe or moderate hot flashes are at an increased risk of heart disease. They have a higher risk of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and high blood sugar. They also have a higher risk of increased inflammation, low bone density, and fractures. Okay, So you don't want to ignore those hot flashes. You don't want to necessarily say, oh, not a big deal. This is normal. Yes, although physiologically this can happen, and those people that have more of a severe imbalance, it probably is going to be more beneficial to treat it. So as, as mentioned earlier, here is, you know, that this is a PET scan um, image um, of the brain and what happens during these different stages of a woman's life. So the red that you see there is brain activity, and that's good. We want to see lots of brain activity. That means, you know, there's the brain is functioning optimally. Um, the blue-green area that you see, or the yellow-green area, I should say, is kind of um, more of a reduced function, and then that blue-green is an even more reduced function. So you can see in the first slide over there, um, on a, in a premenopausal woman who's still uh, menstruating, a lot more of the red, good brain activity. Perimenopause, much, much reduced red activity pretty quickly, right? And then you can see in a postmenopausal woman, very little of the red and a lot more of the blue, green, and yellow. So um, it definitely impacts it. And in fact, it's also been... Um, stated that for women that are already prone to dementia or have high risk of Alzheimer's, you know, most of that's going to occur during this whole menopausal transition. And um, some studies have shown that taking estrogen during this particular phase in that particular person may reduce the risk of Alzheimer's and dementia, although more studies are needed on that. Menopause also leads to accelerated progression of plaque or atherosclerosis in the arteries, okay? And in fact, those women that have an early menopause before that average age of 48 to 52 have an increased risk of earlier heart disease. In fact, women have a much lower risk of heart disease compared to men when they're cycling. When they hit menopause and those estrogen and progesterone levels drop, especially estrogen, then all of a sudden they are at equal risk to men in terms of developing heart disease. Okay. And you can see the loss of estrogen, you know, creates all those changes in the arteries as stated on this slide. Again, you will be getting a recording of this. So feel free to read all of this in much more detail, you know, as you kind of look through it on your own. Okay. And uh, I just also a reminder, feel free to put any questions in the chat box, you know, um, as you think of them, and we will go over those questions at the end. So I'm a victim of identity theft. Menopause took a happy, slim, sexy woman and turned her into me, right? Um, yeah, unfortunately, the hormones, <laughs> when they're gone, yes, they can really change a person. And one common line I hear from a lot of women undergoing menopause is, I just don't feel like myself. And anytime a woman says that, the first thing I think is hormones, because I can't tell you how often I hear that line with hormone imbalances. So how do we treat hormone imbalances? Well, number one, look for the underlying cause, right? Again, tests don't guess, see what's going on because based on what's happening, you know, we can be more targeted in what we're trying to do, as I explained earlier in the presentation. You know, make sure you're looking at environmental toxins, gut health, liver detox, et cetera. Balanced diet and exercise regimen, very important. Sleep and stress management, very important. And then when needed, you can actually take certain targeted um, specific um, supplements and herbal remedies, as well as bioidentical hormone replacement. You know, sleep is very important. I think most people understand that sleep is important, but I don't think most people understand exactly how important sleep is, okay? Extremely important. In fact, for most of my patients, I always tell them you've got two rules, you're not allowed to not sleep and you're not allowed to be constipated. If we, if these two things can, you know, be working well, so many other things can be working well because these are foundational. This is just kind of a, you know, a, a pictorial slide put out by the World Sleep Society on some, some tips for better sleep. Same with stress management. You know, again, I think most people realize how important it is to manage and control stress, but I don't think people 
understand just how important it is, okay? Remember, stress is also the adrenal glands um, really handle a lot of our stress, produce cortisol, DHEA. And as I mentioned earlier, all of those hormones in the orchestra are intertwined so they can affect each other and affect the way we feel and our health. Four A's to stress management. I kind of like this and try to follow a lot of this myself, you know, avoid unnecessary stress. If it's still there, try to alter the situation. If it's still there, try to adapt to the situation. And finally, accept the things that you can't change. There's no point in keep dwelling it on it if you cannot change it, right? Whatever you can change, do so. Whatever you can't, accept it and move on. I know a lot of this is easier said than done, but these are goals that we should be working towards. And just like with everything else, practice makes perfect. How you try to manage stress in your life, same thing, practice makes perfect. All right, so hormone replacement therapy is also a type of treatment. Um, when you take hormones, because the ones in your that your body naturally produces are low or out of balance. So as you can see on the slide there, hormone therapy will make you feel much better. I'm replacing your hormones with rainbows, sunshine, and glitter. So let's talk a little bit about how hormone therapy works in the body. So kind of similar to that very first slide I showed you on the experiment with the um, chickens and the testes, same concept over here, right? So you look at that first um, picture, the healthy bone cell, when there's adequate hormones in that cell, then those minerals go into the cell very nicely. Our cells hold on to that calcium and we've got good bone health. In slide two, there's low hormone levels. So when those level uh, hormone levels are low, a lot of those minerals are leaking out of those bone cells, right? Causing bone loss. And then in slide three, that's a cell in which hormone replacement therapy is being given where we're actually artificially raising those hormone levels and now those minerals go back into the cells, okay? So with hormone therapy, those additional hormones lock onto the receptors of that cell, again, that lock and key mechanism and help to repair that imbalance between the minerals absorbed and minerals returned back into the bloodstream. So that's just an example. Now let's talk a little bit about hormone replacement therapy. So in the past, um, not too long ago, before 2002, hormone therapy was actually recommended for all postmenopausal women, not just to help with their symptoms, but for also treating long-term medical complications of menopause, right? So as soon as a, turn, a woman was turning menopausal or turned menopausal, the doctor said, why don't we start you on you know, hormone therapy because it's good for you. And most women would start it. That was the standard of care. Then a huge clinical trial came out in 2002, which kind of changed everything, created all this fear and stopped, you know, that particular way of practicing. This was called the Women's Health Initiative Study. What was this? This was a trial which examined the risk and benefits of long-term hormone therapy use. Now, in this particular trial, they used synthetic, they had two, they divided women into two groups. One group was those using synthetic estrogen alone, and the other group was those using a combination of synthetic estrogen and synthetic progesterone. This trial was supposed to last eight years. They actually had to stop the trial early in five years because of the significantly increased risk of breast cancer, strokes, heart attacks, and blood clots. As a result of these findings, all of a sudden, you know, worldwide, doctors took patients off of the hormone therapy. They said, oh, too dangerous. We got to stop this, right? And a bunch of women went off, felt miserable. And that's kind of when bioidentical hormones started to become more popular, okay? Synthetic hormones are synthetic or man-made. Bioidentical hormones are also man-made, but the difference is they come from plants instead of chemicals, and they're identical in structure to the hormones in our own body, unlike the synthetic. And we'll get into all of that in more detail later on. Right. So all these women were kind of like, well, I feel miserable. I can't see myself living my life like this. And, you know, what else can I do? And hence the advent of, you know, other methods of trying to find hormone balance. You know, the question was, were these hormones really that dangerous? Um, not really. And that's what I'm going to get into in the next few slides over here. The problem is the media is really the one that grasped a hold and created all this widespread panic over the safety of hormone therapy. This was on all kinds of news all over the world for a long, long time that hormones are bad, hormones are bad, hormones are bad. They said, wow, there's a 25% risk of uh, breast cancer, 30% increased risk of heart disease, 40% increased risk of stroke. Was that really the case? Actually, no. 
that was not the case. Okay, so before the scientists could really, you know, interpret the study in, in a better way, all of this kind of got, you know, out of control and out of hand. And for many, many years, up until very recently, the standard of care was, nope, we're not going to give you hormones unless absolutely necessary. And we have you kind of sign all these consents that, hey, you know, you have to, you know, sign a consent if you want to start hormones, otherwise it's too dangerous and blah, 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 blah. Okay. So let's break some of this down. So this particular style, like a trial, like I said, it was a huge trial, 27, over 27,000 women. Um, I want to, you know, really kind of mention that this trial, again, only uses synthetic hormones, either synthetic estrogen alone or synthetic estrogen and progesterone. Now, the important thing to consider in this particular trial over here is that nearly 70% of the women in the study were over the age of 60 when they started their hormone treatment. Now, the average age of menopause is 51. A woman that's undergoing severe menopausal symptoms is not going to be 66. She's going to be about 50 or 51 years old. And that's a very, very different risk profile. Okay. So when researchers went back and they re-examined all this data, they noticed that the trial was focused on older women. The average age, again, of the women in the study was 63. And the average age of the women in the study was over 10 years past menopause. As you can see on the right side over there, women that were in their 50 to 59-year-old age group, only 33% of the women were of this age in this study. Okay, so what they found that is when they only looked at that particular age group, that estrogen therapy actually reduced the risk of death related to heart disease and breast cancer, and it was quite significant, all right? So as we get older, our risk for all of these things go up anyway, right? And the neat thing is, if you actually start the hormones at the right age, you can actually reduce your risk of all of those things. But if you start hormones 10 years after menopause or after the age of 60, guess what? It's not going to have the same benefit. So let's break all that up a little bit. As you can see on this slide, there's four um, conditions that are being looked at. CHD stands for coronary heart disease, breast cancer, stroke, and VTE stands for blood clots. All right. So um, this graph shows the number of these events broken up by these different age groups. And this particular graph is only is done on only those women that only took the estrogen. And keep in mind, again, this is synthetic, not bioidentical estrogen. As you can see here in the first group, 50 to 59 years old, there was actually a reduced risk of heart disease and breast cancer, significantly reduced, and only a little bit of an increased risk of stroke and blood clots. In the women in the 60 to 69 year old age group, Believe it or not, even in them, there was actually a reduced risk of heart disease and breast cancer, but there was a significantly increased risk of stroke. And then in the older age group, 70 to 79, everything was increased, okay? On this next slide, same thing, except these are the women that got both synthetic estrogen and progesterone. Notice over here, in all the age groups, the risk of all of these conditions increased, but of course they got worse as, you know, as the age got older. So what does this tell us? It was actually the synthetic progesterone that was the harmful hormone, not synthetic estrogen. So poor estrogen has gotten this bad reputation for all of these years when all along it was synthetic progesterone that was the problem, better known as progestogen. Okay, people use that in term interchangeably, but synthetic progesterone is actually called progestogen. Okay, so this was very enlightening. This is kind of putting all of that together. The top uh, um, graph over there shows people that were only taking estrogen in terms of looking at all of those different conditions in only the 50 to 59 year old age group. Okay, so we're just looking at the women's in their 50s, the ones that were taking synthetic estrogen in the top, you can see except for clotting um, in the legs and in the lungs, which increased a little bit, right? Those first two ones over there, everything else actually reduced dramatically. Even diabetes risk reduced by minus 26, okay? So what does this show? This shows that even in that big study done in 2002, the benefits of synthetic estrogen were much higher than the risks. In the bottom slide, for those women that were taking the estrogen and progesterone, again, in that same age group, um, the risk of clotting, stroke, and breast cancer did go up a little bit, but actually all those other things reduced, even in that particular profile.
Okay, so a very, very flawed study, which was misinterpreted properly. So putting a summary of all that evidence together in young postmenopausal women, so these are the 50 to 59 year old age group, the conclusion is that hormone therapy reduces the risk of death from any cause by 31%. The majority of evidence shows a reduced risk of heart disease using synthetic estrogen alone. In fact, even aspirin and statins have not been shown to reduce the risk of these conditions as much as hormone therapy has. So if you're a 50 to 59 year old woman and you had to choose between hormone therapy and aspirins and statins, I mean, ultimately the choice is up to you, but based on all of these, you know, findings over here, it certainly makes more sense to reduce the risk using hormone therapy rather than aspirin and statins. Now this suggests that again, progesterone or that synthetic progestogen is the main cause of any kind of increased risk. Um, even in the women that took both the synthetic estrogen and progesterone, even though some of those risks were higher, they were very minimally higher, okay? So there were only nine additional cases of um, breast cancer in the women that took both of these hormones. That kind of equals about one extra person getting breast cancer per 1,000 patients that were taking both those synthetic hormones. Not really a whole lot, right? That's less than the risk of somebody that drinks two glasses of wine a day. And it's similar or less than the risk of somebody with obesity, a sedentary lifestyle, and many other commonly used medications out there, right? Now, that being said, um, since then, there's been a lot of observational evidence that has proven or shown that bioidentical progesterone has been found to be much safer than synthetic progestogen, right? So that reduces your risk even further if you're using the bioidentical. Are you all with me here? I know I'm kind of getting into a lot of medical detail uh, related stuff, which I don't typically do in most of my, um, but I think this is very important to kind of debunk a lot of these myths because there's so much fear surrounding hormone replacement therapy, when in reality, there's so many people suffering out there that could be feeling a lot better and reducing, you know, their risk of so many different things along with that. Now, in terms of blood clots, um, healthy women that have, you know, low risk factors that the general probability of developing a blood clot is very low. In general, the risk of blood clot increases with age and the presence of additional risk factors, you know, smoking, heart disease, obesity, et cetera. And generally speaking, transdermal bioidentical estrogen, which is, you know, uh, estradiol patches or the cream form of estrogen has had a significantly lower risk compared to oral estrogen of blood clotting. And there's plenty of adequate research um, out there that proves that natural bioidentical progesterone is actually not associated with increased risk of blood clots, whereas again, the synthetic progestogens do. And vaginal estrogen, actually, there's no risk of increased blood clots. I'm not going to get into detail on this slide, but you can see over there the differences between natural bioidentical progesterone versus synthetic progestogens. In many cases, opposite actions, right? You can see progesterone reduces risk of breast cancer, whereas progestogens actually increase risk of breast cancer. Since then, many other studies have been done um, since that 2002 studies. In fact, in 2015, there was this kind of this analysis done of 19 different trials, 40,000, you know, over 40,000 uh, different postmenopausal women. And what they concluded was that women that started hormone therapy within 10 years of menopause, on average, there was a reduced risk of heart disease by 48%, reduced risk of death by any cause by 30%. So again, in conclusion, hormone therapy has benefit for heart disease prevention in the right patient. So who is that right patient? Well, timing is key. All right, so if you're 60 or older, or if you're not really experiencing a lot of menopausal symptoms, um, then you're unlikely to have too much of the benefit of the, of the hormone therapy, okay? So the longer you wait to start hormones, the more likely it is that you'll be deep into other health problems that come with age. Okay. So if it's been um, 10 years or more since your last period, or if you're over 60, then hormone therapy may not be such a good idea. But if you're somewhere between five and 10 years out, okay, and if you have low risk in general, um, and you're under the age of 60, hormone therapy can be pretty beneficial. 
The American Heart Association also put out a scientific statement in 2020 um, that supports the use of hormone replacement therapy. You can see the last line there where it says the benefits of hormone therapy appear to outweigh the risk for the majority of early menopausal women. So what are the differences between synthetic and bioidentical? The main difference really is the substances used to create them, as I kind of mentioned or alluded to earlier. Um, synthetic hormone therapy products are made from the urine of pregnant horses. And although that's natural to pregnant horses, it's very, very unnatural to humans. The problem with the synthetic estrogen is it's it's got you know higher amounts of estrone in it, right? That bad estrogen, and it doesn't get metabolized and processed from the body quite as well. And that's one of the reasons it holds in general higher risk. But as I proved today, Day, not as high as everyone's been thinking of it, and certainly not as dangerous. And even the synthetic estrogen seems to have some benefit. Whereas bioidentical hormones are usually derived from plant sources and are structurally identical to the hormones that your own body produces. Bioidentical hormones are usually compounded in labs or pharmacies from yams or soy, in the United States mostly from soy. Um, and they can be pretty individualized or custom made. Um, you can get them from compounding pharmacies, but you can also get them from regular pharmacies. Estradiol and progesterone come from your regular pharmacies. The only difference is sometimes you want precise dosing, which you may have to get from a compounding pharmacy. And as I mentioned earlier, bioidentical hormones do have been proven to have fewer side effects, especially if they're in a transdermal form. The nice thing with bioidenticals is that, you know, you can use an individualized approach, approach as I mentioned, a precise dosage, um, and it comes in all different forms, you know, um, patches, creams, trochies, pills, sublingual shots, um, but the key is close monitoring. So it's not like, oh, you're menopausal, let's just start you on estrogen and progesterone automatically. No, I, I, it doesn't work that way. At least I don't think it does. It's very important to do a complete hormone profile. Let's look at the orchestra, what your thyroid's doing, what your ovarian or test, you know, um, testicular hormones are doing and what your adrenal hormones are doing, what your insulin's doing, how they're all interplaying or interconnecting with each other and then balancing them accordingly. Because like I said, a lot of postmenopausal women may not actually even need estrogen. Maybe they just need the progesterone. So how do you know? You test, don't guess. And in general, you know, once you do start, you want to be monitored through regular follow-up hormone panels to obtain symptom relief at the lowest possible dosage. So HRT or not, ultimately it's your choice. Now, I, I want to say that um, a quick side note over here that, you know, the hormone replacement therapy, I think that's a very old term um, because, you know, that suggests that you're you're replacing all the hormone that you had maybe at the age of 23, right? Where that's not really the case. We're not replacing the same hormone levels we once had. We're just giving you a very small amount of hormones to alleviate your symptoms to make you feel better and to help with the preventive health aspects that we spoke about. It's a minor but very important difference that emphasizes that these are very small doses. In fact, when you use these bioidentical doses, it's actually a much smaller amount of hormone than you get from birth control pills. You know, I always find it ironic that people are so comfortable with taking birth control pills, but then so scared to take bioidentical hormones. Guess what? Birth control pills have synthetic estrogen and progesterone in it. Okay. And in fact, they can also increase your risk of certain health complications, including blood clots. Okay. So again, hormone therapy, I think is a better term than hormone replacement therapy, um, which means you're just putting in a little bit of hormone back into your body to help things work in a better way or in a more balanced way, I should say. Right. So ultimately, HRT or not, it's your choice, right? Completely up to you based on your comfort level. Um, but I really just wanted to put some of this information out there. And even if you choose not to do hormone replacement therapy, not everybody needs it, certainly. Um, and not everybody is the right candidate for it, right? So if you're the right candidate and if you need it, all the main thing I wanted to get across in this talk is don't fear it, okay? There's no reason to fear it and it can be very, very beneficial. And if you choose not to do it or if you're not the right candidate, don't be disheartened that you know, you're gonna continue to feel miserable. There are other things you can absolutely do to help balance hormones as well. Again, through targeted supplements, natural herbs and targeted lifestyle changes. So stop the struggle, transform your body, and recapture your health and happiness.
All right. So um, as you can see on the slide, there's some of our contact information. Um, please feel free to reach out to us. You know, if you have um, further questions or if you would like to schedule any appointments, I'm just one of the physicians um, at Rose Wellness or other physicians as well um, that also, uh, you know, are experts in hormone replacement therapy. So feel free to see any one of us if you'd like to, or if you just simply want more information. Like I said, you will already be getting a copy of all of these slides. And there's some things, you know, um, that I've tried to put on the slides that you can already start doing even on your own, you know, without external help. But if you feel like you're at the point where you need external help, you know, feel free to reach out to us. Um, at this point, uh, I'm going to uh, go ahead and, and let you ask any questions. Please feel free to type in your questions in the chat box um, and we can go over those. <laughs> 